welcome again to the uh, course new properties of materials. So, we will just briefly recap the contents of last lecture. So, in the last lecture we discussed started our discussion on plaster deformation and we initiated with stress strain curve. And the most common of these is engineering stress strain curve, but at the same time you can also have a true stress strain curve. <coughs> so, if you plot them together, so the engineering stress strain curve will appear as something like this. So, there is a onset of yielding so this is elastic region so this will be sigma e and this will be e okay the engineering stress engineering strength this is nonlinear region and so in this region you have plastic deformation and at the end we have what we call as fracture and the various characteristics that we can determine from this sigma y and then the maximum stress required for deformation is sigma u t s ultimate tensile strength and then we have sigma f which is E f let us say the stress to fracture and this is E f E y E u. There could be another curve which is uh, fairly similar up to this point and then it sort of takes off like this. So, so this is true stress strain curve and uh, uh, true stress strain curve coincides the yielding roughly at the same point, but the stress in the true stress is always higher than the stress in the true uh, engineering stress and strain and we will see the reasons a little later. The quantities that you can extract from this uh, uh, stress strain curve are mainly stiffness which is the slope of linear region which is basically the resistance to elastic deformation then we can derive strength which is basically strength stress that is required to cause the deformation or resistance to passive deformation which is derived by sigma y the yield strength. Then we have toughness which is area under the curve that is the energy absorbed before fracturing. So, that is a measure of toughness and then ductility is basically strain to fracture how much can you strain the material before it fractures and then we also notice that the material gets work hardened which means as you continue with the deformation the stress required to deform the material further increases and this is called as work hardening or strain hardening and we also looked at two other quantities. So, and we need to distinguish between true stress and engineering strain. Uh, so, engineering stress as we defined was um, sigma E is equal to P divided by A naught where it is load divided by original area and engineering strain is delta L divided by L naught change in length divided by original length whereas, true stress is defined as load divided by instantaneous area and true strain is defined as d l over l. So, so if you want to calculate d epsilon and if you want to calculate the overall strain then you have to integrate this from initial to final uh, final length. So, essentially uh, you can say this will become epsilon will become ln l f over l naught. 
So, this will be the and the difference between the two is summarized in these two equations. So, sigma 2 stress is equal to sigma e into e plus 1 and epsilon is equal to ln of e plus 1. And these are the two relations which summarize the and then we also looked at the true stress follows a relation sigma is equal to k epsilon to the power n where k is strength coefficient and n is strain hardening exponent typically from point 0.1 to point 0.5. So, this is what we did in the last lecture and now let us move on to the contents of this lecture that. So, we saw that from elastic deform from elastic deformation we can calculate properties such as Young's modulus and resilience. So, we will explain in a while what resilience is from plastic deformation up so up so up to the onset of yielding or plastic deformation we can determine things like yield stress is something called as proof stress. So, this is basically 0 0.2 percent proof and then sigma proportional uh, limit. And then plaster deformation region gives us information of sigma u t s, sigma f ductility this is what we have seen, but we can also find out things like elongation, uh, uh, toughness and strain hardening exponent. So, there are some terms which we have not seen earlier for example, what is proportional limit. Proportional limit is basically you can say the stress up to which Hooke's law is valid. So, basically in the strict sense it is a linear region only. Okay. So, that is linear region of stress strain curve. And then second thing is elastic limit. Elastic limit is highest stress that a sample can withstand without any measurable plastic strain. So, basically this is to do with the accuracy of measurement. So, since every measurement equipment has certain limitation, so as long as you are below that detection limit that is the stress which is called as elastic limit upon removal of a float. Now, the next thing is proof stress. So, generally you will see that sigma elastic will be higher than sigma uh, proportional because remember this is strictly for linear region whereas this can slightly exceed the linear region because of uh, measurement uh, constraints. So, this is always a little higher. Now, proof stress is stress corresponding to 0 0.2 percent strain okay, or 0 0.002 strain. 
So, this is what proof stress will be. So, these are the differences between proportional limit, elastic limit and proof, proof stress. Now, let us look at what is resilience. Resilience is as we, as we said, if you plot stress versus strain, so this is the point at which yielding will start sigma y. So, area under the curve of elastic region, so this is basically you can say area under the elastic portion of the stress strain curve. And what does it depict? It depicts ability to absorb energy when a material is elastically deformed and then to return to original state upon load removal. So, basically this is useful for things like springs. So, you have springs you can stretch it in the elastic region and then unload it. So, things like springs or if you have a elastic beam which is supposed to deflect up and down. So, elastic beams even for things like tennis rackets and so on and so forth wherever things need to deform elastically and then come back to their original uh, condition without getting plastically deformed. So, higher energy is higher resilience is always good. So, let me give you just an example. So, let us say we plot two materials here, one is a material like this, and another is a material which is something like this. So, let me just sorry. Okay. So, we have one sample let us say as high carbon spring steel and another sample is let us say some sort of uh, low carbon steel let us say for structures. So, if you look at this plot then so we can see that the area under the elastic region for this and the area under the elastic region for these, these two are different. So, basically we can see that spring steel has higher resilience okay, because area in the elastic region is higher for a spring steel than for the uh, low carbon steel. But if you look at the toughness toughness for this is, this is the area under the curve and this is the area under the curve for this. So, basically here it seems that toughness of low carbon steel is 
perhaps higher than high carbon spring steel. So, this is where you can see for applications such as springs um, of elastic beams or tennis rackets. So, uh, wherever things have to deflect a little bit elastically and then come back to the original position, um, they are uh, they have to be they have to have higher resilience, but the things which require higher toughness that is before breaking they have higher ability to absorb energy that is why they are and they require higher toughness. Okay. So, this is the fundamental difference between the two characteristics. Now, let us look at what is ductility. So, ductility is basically defined as it can be defined by strain at fracture which can be defined which can be written as E f could be equal to L f minus L naught divided by L naught or it could also be written as. So, when you have a sample like this not only it is um, so, when you deform it, it becomes like this. So, basically if the initial length is L naught and area is A naught cross sectional area and the final one is L f and A f, you can see that L f is greater than L naught, but A f is smaller than A naught because the volume remains constant. So, this constancy of volume is an important thing in plastic deformation that as volume of the material remains constant during deformation. Okay. So, Alternatively, we can also express the elastic strain as ln of A naught divided by A f. We can also write epsilon f here, epsilon f could be ln of L f divided by L naught and this can be also written as epsilon f. f can be written as ln of A naught divided by A f or uh, you can write this as um, E f can be written as um, A naught minus A f divided by A naught. So, these are the different ways of writing strains uh, for diff uh, and basically higher the strain is more the ductility is. We can also quantify this as a reduction in area. So, this reduction in area can be called as Q generally it is not written as E f, but more as Q which is percentage reduction in area is the measure of percentage ductility that is A naught minus A f divided by A naught. So, this is basically increase in length or decrease in the area are two measures of ductility of a material that are considered. Another difference between stress, so now the question is what is the difference between the true stress and true stress. So, having known you know the quantities that you can derive from a stress strain curve, now let us get back to the question of what is the difference between true stress and true strain curve. So, now when you plot them together this is what we see. So, we have sigma e and sigma epsilon and e. Okay. So, the true engineering stress will look like something like this and the true stress will look something like this. One thing first we notice is that the engineering stress is always lower than the true stress. Okay. So, basically first thing that we notice is that engineering mm -hmm. 
and this is because sigma is p divided by a i whereas, sigma engineering is so sigma t let us say sigma t is p divided by a i and sigma e is p divided by a naught. And since a i is always lower than a naught the true stress is always higher than engineering stress that is one difference. Second difference is every point on after yielding between elastic region and up to ultimate tensile stress every point on engineering stress plot corresponding point on the true strain true stress strain plot will lie slightly to the left of the point on engineering stress strain curve and that is because of difference between the two values. So, let us compare that. So, when we make a table for example, for engineering and true values. So, let us say let us make a table. So, let us first calculate what is E which is delta L by L naught and then let us say we first cal we calculate sigma E in MPA which is nothing but P divided by A naught. So, let us write the value for this it is 0 0.03 to 0 0.04 0 0.052 0 0.06 0 0.06 0 0.072 so 60 okay then 0 0.080 0 0.092 0 0.115 if we calculate the stresses at this point so this is 550.83 553 553.83, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 553.43, 
they will be slightly to the left and the leftward tilt increases as you move towards. So, this is true, this is engineering. Okay. I hope it is clear the difference between the true stress and true strain curve. So, we will stop here in this lecture. Uh, we will discuss some more differences in the next class uh, before we learn more about the plastic deformation. Thank you. Thank you.